a serial killer named Peter Sutcliffe terrorized England for five long years. His barbaric murders earned him the chilling nickname Yorkshire Butcher. Claiming a divine mission to rid the streets of prostitutes, Peter Sutcliffe cruelly murdered at least 13 women and injured at least seven others. Even though he died of COVID-19 in November 2020, the moniker Yorkshire Butcher and the chilling story of this murderer continue to haunt the world. In late 2020, Netflix released a documentary titled The Ripper that primarily features interviews with insiders like police officers and reporters. The documentary also incorporates restored footage. The four-part documentary follows the police pursuit of a cold-blooded murderer while also exploring societal views of women at the time, particularly those who worked as prostitutes. Born in 1946 in Bingley, Yorkshire, to a devout working-class family, Peter Sutcliffe seemed ordinary to those around him. Unlike many serial killers, he had a loving relationship with his parents, Mr. John William Sutcliffe and Mrs. Kathleen Francis. However, Peter was shy and had few friends. His father disapproved of his dislike for sports and outdoor activities, and the family teased him for his long showers, exceeding even the women in the household. After leaving school in 1961 at age 15, Peter became an apprentice mechanic in Bingley. In 1964, he switched to working as a grave digger and undertaker, motivated by the opportunity to steal valuables from the deceased. However, poor time management and frequent tardiness led to his dismissal soon after. After losing his job, Peter worked as a packaging worker at Baird TV from November 1971 to April 1973. He quit, however, when they transferred him to a sales position. Following this, he took a night shift job at Anderton Factory. In February 1975, Peter took redundancy with a 200-pound severance package. He used this money to get his HGV license and secure a job at an industrial equipment transport company. However, he was fired in March 1976 for stealing used tires. By October 1976, he found work as a driver for T. and W. H. Clark, a role that later provided him with the freedom to move around the area undetected. Even as a teenager, Peter was famous among the cemetery workers for his sick sense of humor. Some police reports later indicated that during this time, Peter used prostitutes to satisfy his sexual needs, but he had a bad experience. Cheated out of all his money by a prostitute and her pimp, he developed an obsession and hatred for prostitutes. This led him to regularly follow them on the streets of nearby Leeds. But there's also information the Yorkshire Ripper himself claimed the voice of God urged him to kill. Before his obsession reached its peak, Peter had built a relatively normal life for himself. He met a local woman named Sonia Surma in 1967 and married her in 1974. The following year, he passed his heavy goods driving test. At that time, he had the opportunity for a stable job and a wife who could manage the housework. However, his truck driver job also allowed him freedom from home without raising questions from his wife. Soon, simply watching prostitutes wasn't enough for Peter. In 1969, Peter Sutcliffe began a series of grisly murder cases that would later become associated with the name Yorkshire Ripper. Prior to his identified murders, Peter Sutcliffe is believed to have assaulted at least four young women. In 1969, one suffered a head injury from a thrown rock. Three others were murdered in 1975 using a hammer and knife. Wilma McCann, a mother of four, became the first victim of the Yorkshire Ripper in late 1975. Attacked at night in her own home, she was stabbed 15 times in the neck and stomach and died from her injuries. Emily Jackson, the next victim of the Yorkshire Ripper, suffered a brutal attack in January 1976. Stabbed three times more than Wilma McCann, Jackson was accosted by Sutcliffe while she was in Leeds. He lured her to a secluded area, where he attacked her with a screwdriver and repeatedly stomped on her. The brutality of the assault left lasting Mark's footprints were reportedly still visible on her body. The same murderous pattern continued in 1977, victims suffered blows to the head with a hammer, followed by brutal stab wounds to the chest and neck, often culminating in sexual assault. It wasn't until that year that police began the slow process of identifying the Yorkshire Ripper. Despite involving over 150 police officers, the hunt for the Yorkshire Ripper remained elusive for years. The investigation was further hampered by hoax letters and a voice recording purporting to be from the killer himself. A crucial break in the case finally came in 1977. The discovery of a five-pound note hidden in a compartment of murdered prostitute Jean Jordan's handbag offered a vital clue. Police traced the bill, hoping it might lead them to a customer who could provide information about her brutal death. Tracing the flow of the money revealed the note could belong to one of roughly 8,000 people who had recently cashed it at a bank. 
Authorities managed to interview around 5,000 of these individuals, including Peter Sutcliffe. However, his alibi checked out. Evading capture once, Peter struck again just two months later, attacking another prostitute, Marilyn Moore. Fortunately, she survived and gave police a detailed description of her assailant, a description that bore a striking resemblance to Peter Sutcliffe. Adding to the suspicion, tire tracks at the scene matched those from a previous attack. Despite repeated questioning, Peter's alibis, corroborated by his wife, and lack of concrete evidence kept him out of police custody. Despite nine interviews with Peter Sutcliffe, a clear link to the murders remained elusive for authorities. Despite not having enough evidence to connect Peter Sutcliffe to the Yorkshire Ripper murders, police arrested him for drunk driving in April 1980. While awaiting trial, he committed further atrocities, killing two more women and attacking three others. In November of that year, a bombshell dropped, an acquaintance of Peter's named Trevor Birdsall came forward with evidence accusing him of being the Yorkshire Ripper. Despite this revelation, Peter inexplicably remained free. On January 2, 1981, while parked in a known prostitution area, Peter Sutcliffe was approached by two police officers who discovered his car had a fake license plate during a routine check. Arrested for this minor offense, Peter's appearance also matched the description of the Yorkshire Ripper, prompting further questioning. Soon after, the police discovered that he was wearing a strange outfit, a jumpsuit with his genitals exposed. Ultimately, the police determined that Peter did this so he could kneel on the victim and easily have sex with the corpse. After two days of interrogation, Peter Sutcliffe confessed he was the Yorkshire Ripper. He then spent the next day describing his many crimes in detail. Peter then appeared in court on 13 counts of murder. He asserted that he did not commit murder but was guilty of manslaughter, claiming diminished responsibility. He claimed to have been diagnosed with paranoid schizophrenia and believed himself to be an instrument of God's will. This is exactly what he told his wife, Sonia Sutcliffe, who did not know anything during the entire crime process. He was sentenced to 20 life sentences, effectively ensuring he would spend the rest of his life in prison. In 1984, Peter Sutcliffe was diagnosed with paranoid schizophrenia and transferred to a secure psychiatric facility called Broadmoor Hospital. A decade later, his wife divorced him. In prison, he faced many attacks from other inmates. Peter Sutcliffe, who was 74 years old, died of COVID-19 in November 2020 while in custody at Her Majesty's Franklin Prison in County Durham. A woman who witnessed the horrors of the Yorkshire Ripper era joined a group campaigning to end violence against women and girls. In 1978, at just 17 years old, she moved to the Leeds neighborhood where the group battled both the police and the media over how to investigate and report the serial killer's murders. She recalled going out with a friend just three days before the murder of Jacqueline Hill, the last victim of the Yorkshire Ripper. She objected when police asked women to stay home at night, arguing that for many, home wasn't a safe haven. Unbeknownst to her, danger lurked that night. She and her girlfriend had an argument, and her friend stormed off, leaving her alone on the deserted road. As she walked, a shiver ran down her spine, someone was behind her. She spun around to see a mysterious figure a few meters away, a man with black hair and a beard, his voice thick with a Yorkshire accent greeting her with a simple hello. Startled, she hurried toward the lights of a nearby pub on the hill. There, she bumped into another man who, sensing her fear, offered to walk her home. By the time they arrived, the mysterious stranger had vanished. However, when she reported this encounter to the police, they dismissed it. They were focused on a suspect from the northeast of England, specifically Wareside. This was because in March 1978, West Yorkshire Police had received a letter from someone claiming responsibility for the crimes and signing themselves as Jack the Butcher. The man dubbed Wareside Jack by police later sent a voice recording to them. Dialect experts confirmed he originated from the northeast of England. These tapes, along with his handwriting samples, were displayed on billboards from March 1978 until Sutcliffe's arrest. However, the woman insisted it was a hoax. The voice on the recording, she asserted, was nothing like the man who followed me that night. His accent was definitely local. I, along with many others, believed Wareside Jack to be a fake. Unfortunately, the police disregarded her reports entirely. Another heroin case involved a young girl, only 14 at the time. During the early days of Peter Sutcliffe's crimes, she bravely reported being attacked with a hammer because she was talking to a man walking beside her. At the police station, she overheard other witnesses describe their encounters with the perpetrator. Recognizing the similarities, she confirmed she had been attacked by the same person. However, in a shocking display of dismissal, the police disregarded her report, dismissing her with the comment, she is not a prostitute. 
the police only began to see these incidents in a completely different light with the case of Jane McDonald. Journalist Joan Smith, who covered the Sutcliffe murders for a local Manchester radio station, obtained a disturbing police file. The file reportedly classified the victims as innocent or not innocent based on class and lifestyle choices like drinking, cohabitation, and mental instability. A misconception persists, echoing the era of the Peter Sutcliffe hunt, that serial killers targeting prostitutes pose no threat to respectable women. This belief stems from the assumption that these killers harbor hatred solely for sex workers. However, ample evidence suggests a deeper pathology, a hatred for women in general. Peter Sutcliffe's case exemplifies this, taking police over a decade to apprehend him. The legacy of the Yorkshire Ripper and the societal attitudes that allowed him to evade capture for so long remain a dark chapter in British history. The case highlighted the biases and prejudices faced by women, particularly those deemed not innocent by authorities. The dismissal of their experiences and the focus on the killer's supposed motive of hating prostitutes ultimately hindered the investigation and delayed justice for the victims. While Peter Sutcliffe's reign of terror has ended, the scars left behind continue to remind us of the importance of recognizing and addressing violence against women, regardless of their profession or lifestyle choices.